um, Kyle Reed. And Kyle is from Olive Harvey College and he worked at the Field Museum. He'll be talking about the bats of Kenya assessing the species limits of cryptic species. Hi everybody, my name is Kyle Reed. Um, I'm from Olive Harvey College. My advisor on this project was Dr. Bruce Patterson, and my project is analyzing the bats of the analyzing morphometrics of the genus Epimorphus, and this is part of the larger Bats of Kenya project. The project entirely is um, to detail the distribution, status, and diagnosis of eco and the ecological habits of the 108 plus uh, bat species currently in Kenya. It's a joint project with the National Museums of Kenya and the Kenyan Wildlife Service. I met two of their officials, uh, Dr. Paul Wabala and David Wachepi. Um, to do this, we're using vocalizations, the calls the bats will make, the habits and the habitats of the bats, the morphometric data which I'm collecting, DNA sequences, and we're using these to find out what are the limits between the species of bats. Why bats? I mean, there's elephants, there's rhinos, why would we focus on bats? So what bats do is they act as pollinators for some of the plant life in Kenya, especially the uh, baobab tree, it's also called the upside down tree. Sort of like how bees or butterflies go around here, they gather nectar and transport between plant to plant. So they're huge ecological impact. They also consume insects, which is a major factor. In America, there was a study done in 2011 that showed that in America, bats consume between 3.7 and 50 billion insects that would otherwise have to be removed with insecticides. So because bats are removing the insects naturally, we don't have to worry about that. In Kenya, where farming is more subsistence-based rather than profit-based, this is going to be measured in meals and lives. My place in the project. So my goal is to gather the and analyze the morphometric data of the current Field Museum collection of epimorphists, as well as the collections that were gathered in 2011 and 2012 by Bruce Patterson and Paul Obala. They brought the specimens in maybe five weeks ago and my job was to make sure everything was right and measure them. Um, to accomplish this, I was trained in proper measurement techniques, make sure you're measuring the right thing, how to tell the um, ages apart, some younger bats will have milk teeth, um, their shoals will not be sutured correctly, and you need to you know, analyze a, small, a young bat from an adult bat. Um, skeleton and skull removal, we need the skeleton, but we cannot damage the skin. And cataloging, how to keep all of these guys in the right place. To do this, I was trained in Statistica and SPSS. I say I was introduced, but I'd say me and Statistica are probably married now. I've spent many, many hours with it. <laughs> um, the genus Epimorphus, the guys I'm working on and why I'm working on them. They're, the order is Chioptera and the family Pteropodidae. They lack echolocation calls. Good thing fruit doesn't run very fast. Which were calls. <laughs> Didn't know as I planned. All right. <laughs> They're named after the epaulets, which are these little furry shoulder pads in the males. They're used to like, you know, show off their, their mating call. They're kind of like those things Michael Jackson used to wear. <laughs> and what they do is they release pheromones and scents that attract females. And I was able to see the mating call of one of these. They hang upside down in a tree and they just flex and scream and flex and scream. It kind of looks like a club nowadays. <laughs> um, All right. Um, the questions I'm looking to answer with my research over the course of the 10 weeks. How are mammal species, excuse me, how are the mammal specimens prepared and organized? How do we keep them so that, has anyone worked with the specimens at the Field Museum? You're gonna see some from, you know, 1800s, early 19s, like just very, you know, longer than around, you know, more, yeah, been around longer than I've been around. And they have fantastic data on them and we need to preserve that and now I'm responsible for that, so how do I do that right? Um, what factors are important in determining the species limits of bats? So what makes specimen A different from specimen B, different from specimen C? What do we look at to find out what species is what species? What well, cryptic species, okay, this is for some reason that phrase. Cryptic species are sort of like sister species. What that means is that they're so closely related that they're not easily separated. Sometimes they're classified as subspecies, sometimes they're classified as sister species. You want to get that right. So, what cryptic species currently exist in the Kenyan bat fauna? And then fourth, what methods can we use? What methods can we use to separate these cryptic species? So, 
say those two that are very similar, and you're going to see that later on. Are they the same, or are they different, and how are we going to figure that out? Do we want to push them apart or pull them together and we're going to use that based on the data we get? So after two weeks of measuring the older specimens, the new specimens arrived, and each specimen had to, this was fun, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> each specimen had to be accounted for, identified, and tagged with the field museum number. Like I said, 1,060 specimens straight out of the National Museums of Kenya, and it was my job to make sure we had everything, that it was the right species, that it was the right number, that it was the right size, and give it its new field museum number where it's going to be held here for, you know, hopefully forever. Specimen preparation, how do we keep these things? Most specimens have their skulls removed, so you guys know the little bats, the micro bats, the insect eating bats have these very complex faces. You've, I'm sure most of you have seen those. Those are used for the echolocation calls. They're used to, you know, respond. Think you scream, your nose starts to look, okay, there's food over there. We need that information. So we have to keep them in 70% ethanol so that future generations can, of course, get that information later. But the skull has just as much juicy data, and we need to get that as well. After the, um, the skull is removed, it's placed in the dermis the beetle colony, which is fantastic. Um, it keeps skulls nice, hard, you know, can be used in the future, whereas old methods like boiling um, can do serious damage and warping of the skull. And then the clean skulls are marked with their permanent field museum number and stored forever, so future generations can gather information, or I can gather information from them five minutes later. The measurements, just a list of measurements. Um, now I'm going to point out the important measurements in my analysis, the greatest length of skull, which is that right there. That proved to be very different. Um, between males and females, the canine length, or where would it be at? Right there. Oh, there we go, that's a better one. Canine width is very important because the males will have larger canines. Um, there's that. Okay, the sample size. The sample size, I originally sampled 250 bats for about 26 different measurements. Now, like I said, we have some bats from the 20s, the 30s, so on and so forth. So some of these schools were not complete. So when I ran my later analysis, I could not use these skulls. Um, so because of that, I had to reduce my sample size. Another thing you're going to see later is, um, I'll just pull it up right now, sexual dimorphism. I ran a univariate analysis test and found that in most species there was no sexual dimorphism. The males were just as large as the females, the females were just as large as the males. But in the species uh, Epimorphus walbergi, the males were statistically larger, just barely, from the females, so that meant I had to choose either male or female. Now, some bat species are um, harems. They have harems, the males will have harems, so we have a far larger female um, collection than we do males, so I decided to go with females for the rest of the project. Another test we did was the comparative analysis test. I just have one up here, testing the greatest length of skull between all of the species, but I had to run this test on every factor again, just pulling one up, for example. Now the bread and butter, that bread, actually I'll say this is the bread, the later one's the butter, of the project. Um, this is the principal component analysis, we saw one earlier. What it does is it's, it's a fun thing to explain. Okay, so humans, we can perceive three dimensions, left, right, up, down, toward, back. This was run on 15 different dimensions. We can't perceive that, there's no easy way to put that in a graph, it's not fun. So what this does is it creates those based on the measurements I've taken, all 15 of them, for each of the 62 complete specimens, and places it on a graph. Um, factor 1 accounted for 87, 88% of all variants, and factor 2 accounted for 4% of all variants. So what this does is it shows you basically where all the differences are within each bat. And this is my fun slide. Yeah, I think that's pretty pictures. So something that we loved about this is that the um, catalog, the, um, the collection of mammal species for bats, and why they put me on this specific bat, is kind of a jumble. You'll see, um, I don't want to say here, uh, storage containers that will be marked Epimorphous cryptoris, cryptoris is scratched out, Gambianus, Gambianus is scratched out, cryptoris is put back again. It's a big mess. So I have, on a lot of these, the tags are just plain wrong. And you'll see on the top left there that two tiny triangles, which are cryptoris, I do this a lot, there we go. Two tiny cryptoris that are in the Gambianus section. So we look at these further on, it's most likely Gambianus, but we have other features we have to look at. Um, our minimus and minor samples were so small that the two are showing up as being very comparable. But I'm sure that if we increase the sample size, we'll have a way better grasp on that. 
And one thing I, you know, I came into this hoping to discover a new species, and my research is showing that I might have eliminated one. The Haldimani and the Wahlberg eye are very closely clustered in the section. And from what I've done further research, that's a huge debate. Some consider Haldimani to be a subspecies of Wahlberg eye, some consider it to be another species, some consider it to be the same species, and my research is showing it to be probably the same species. Um, Obviously, my test was only on morphometrics, so other things like those ectoparasites we're gathering, the location of these specimens, the cause of the specimens, the DNA of the specimens, all to be taken into effect. But for my small part on this, that's what I get to provide, that they look pretty darn similar. Um, sort of a repeat of what I did is the discriminant function analysis. The same 15 um, skull variables, same 62 females, and you'll see that the Walker guy and Haldimani have a 0.299.3 um, p-value, which basically says that probability, 30%, you're gonna get it in the wrong place, which is huge, statistically significant. 0.05 is what we're looking for, and that's where most of these end up. Again, we have a similar issue with the minor. Um, with only two samples, you're gonna get a lot of confusion, so I'm hoping that I can add more to my minor collection later on. We confirm this with a uh, posterior probability test. A posterior probability test, yeah, I'm jumping that. Posterior probability test basically creates a number for each specimen and then tests the number that each species, it creates a number for each species and then creates another number for each specimen and then tries to line the two up. And some of them ended up in the wrong place, mostly the Halderman and Walker guy. So with this discussion, I have pretty good evidence that Haldermani and Walker guy should be condensed into one species, and that minor and minimus should definitely be looked at a little bit more. Um, we're going to continue adding data to this project, though. I only have the morphometrics. I need to start looking at the um, ectolocation calls, the DNA, and the ectoparasites. And then sampling new habitats. We mostly sampled from just Kenya and a little bit of Zaire, which is the Diplomatic Republic of Congo. Um, and Uganda. So adding new specimens will definitely add to the uh, collection. Uh, conclusion announcements. Uh, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed this. I don't want to leave. I want to keep going. I feel like I've actually <laughs> contributed to science in some way, so <laughs> I want to keep doing this. Um, thank you to Bruce Patterson and Paul Bella for their direct guidance and support. I mean, I was going to them all the time. What is this? What is this? What is this? And they were always ready to guide me again. Uh, I want to thank David Wachuli. He's um, one of the representatives from the National Museums of Kenya, and he really helped me get a student's perspective on what I was doing. Um, Dr. Oliver Curtis for introducing me to the world of biology. I originally was going to be a medical student, and I'm so glad I didn't go that route. Um, I was looking for a job instead of a career, and now I feel like I'm looking for a career, so I definitely wanted to point him out. Anna Goldman for helping me in mammal prep. She rips souls out of mammals like nobody's business. <laughs> um, Stephanie Ware for helping me with keep my head on straight. She was sort of the, you know, hands-on, behind-the-scenes guy for this RU internship. And Dr. Petra and Dr. Petra Sirwal and Dr. Ken Angelzik for their guidance and getting the NSF grant and the NSF itself. Thank you guys. Um, not many of the specimens I got, they were all removed from that, but I have been, you know, getting some side research on that. Um, most of the, none of these that I worked on were endangered in any way, but that's definitely a concern looking forward. Um, so stop that, actually, the research I did, that I pointed out earlier, the um, 2011 report that, you know, they saved 3.7 billion to 50 billion worth of insecticides is leading to some of the research on that. So, not, you know, I didn't, nothing I did involve that, but I have looked at it. And, Hopefully, we'll get some more funding to stop that. What that is is it's sort of a disease that infects a bat, um, and then it can be spread around the colony, doing severe damage to an entire population. I mean, you'll see an entire cave gone like that. If anybody didn't know what that was, the white nose syndrome. Anybody else? Come on. <laughs> okay. When you did PCA analysis, the PCA? Yeah. When you did the PCA, did you go back and take a look at weights on your axes? Um, no, I didn't check that, but I did check on the univariate analysis which factors were most important. 
and that turned out to be Gray's Length of Skull, Brain Case Breath, and um, Width of Canines. It turned out to be some of the main factors in pulling that apart. I didn't do like a reverse of the PCA, but I did in my univariate analysis come across that. Is that how much you look for? Okay, so that's, what it does is, like I said, we have this set of 15 dimensions, and we can't see 15 dimensions. So what it does is it creates an imaginary line, which is not a single factor. It's not a single statistic. It creates an imaginary line that is then used to guide the other placements on the point. So with that one line, we're able to see, okay, Minimus is all the way over here, uh, Ganganus is all the way over there, and sort of place them on all of their different measurements.